This is Coder Radio, episode 277 for September 29th, 2017. And welcome to Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. The show is brought to you by our two excellent sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. My name is Wes, and joining me, as always, is that bot wrangling master, Mr. Michael Dominic. Welcome to the show, Michael. The humans are dead. Long live! The bots. Rain the bots. Oh, yeah. How are you doing today? It's nice to be here. Well, I am much better than I was, Wes. How are you? I'm doing wonderfully, but I'm a little concerned because um, the Node.js community, nah. it's just, I mean, is it ever good? No, but it uh, seems like there's even more of a hubbub these days. You know... Let's talk about civil wars for a moment. Yes. I now live in the South. And you so you think see... about you think about leaving the Union every day. That's what I hear. No, I I can't go a day or frankly to a bar, which is like going a day. Yeah, yeah. Without hearing about the Civil War. And let me tell you, the scars run deep. I have been quote called the quote only nice Yankee I've ever met. The only good Yankee I've ever met, and the only honorable Yankee I've ever met. All in Probably a week. Wow. So let's talk about that in the context of forking major open source projects for philosophical differences. And then we come to Node.js, which is the latest victim of radical politics and open source, I would say. What do you mean by that? Yes. Well, so I don't want to get into details because I not only do I not know enough about it, but frankly, I don't give a damn, miss. Like, <laughs> really. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Speaking of the South, right? Miss Scarlet. Miss Miss Scarlet. I frankly miss, I don't give a damn. Um, There's some political issue within blah, 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 inclusiveness. Who gives a shit? Does it matter? I mean, well, let me ask a question. I'm assuming it doesn't matter. Wes, you're a more honorable man than I am. Do you care about the politics of the open source maintainer when you contribute to a product? Maybe a little. Maybe a little. Um, I, I really. Would, I would try well, to. I would try to okay. separate it. Right. Like I would. Well, I wouldn't stipulate. want to. Let's. Well, let's stipulate for the sake of argument. Yes. There are no Nazis. There are no like pure racist anti semites. No pure misogynists. Right. We're talking about like, like I'm a pretty conservative guy. Like I am as far right wing as you're gonna get. Let's just say I am the most right wing guy you're gonna have. Okay. See. So see. At that level. Um. I don't I I would think I shouldn't need to care, right? Like if they're doing a right. good if the software is good, if they're doing a good job and I don't reasonably think that the software so, or my contributions might go to harm someone right. so, or something. So in the tech industry, right, it's mostly liberals. And I deal with liberals all the time. I contribute to their projects, they contribute to mine. I politics never comes into it, right? Mm-hmm. Except of course when it's time to pick up a bar tab and I always have to fucking do it. Sorry. Oh Ooh, man, okay. We if we ever see each other, I'm buying you some beer, that's for sure. Uh, first of all, Chris owes me a hundred beers for not outing him as a closet Mac user. Oh wow, that's that's noble of you. Whoops, Whoops. I just did that. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we'll have to get you some beers anyway. So, my point is, I'm a little conflicted here. Obviously, the accusation, and I don't want to go into the details, but it's it's a pretty pretty rough accusation, right? If it's true, I get it. But if it's not true, or, you know, what is the line? At what point does the project, the open source project, become liable for the beliefs of the maintainers, I guess, is the real question here, right? Yes. That that is my actual question. At what point does the project become liable for the beliefs of the maintainers? And I mean, I I guess that, I guess it has to be when... When the beliefs of the maintainers, whether whether truthfully or just to perceived, 
are a barrier or are impacting the health, the growth, or the current state of the project, I guess. So, like, I could imagine a community that became so, uh, whichever, you know, like, so ingrained in whatever beliefs that didn't work or were aggressively... Well, these are political, right? These are, like, social political beliefs we're talking about, not technological. Right, yes. Um, so, so I could see like an overly hostile environment being being a barrier. But if, if it's just people on the outside and that doesn't affect in a meaningful way the way that you can contribute to the project, then I don't know. Okay, so you looked at this case with Node like I did. And first of all, I just want to say there are lots of reasons to not contribute to Node that have nothing to do with politics. <laughs> One, it's a bad idea. Two, it's still a bad idea. Three, what the fuck? So... But you read the same things I read. You you followed this. Mm-hmm. Is this like, have we gone? I, see, I don't want to sound like Rush Limbaugh because I hate him. I think he gives conservatives a bad name. Oh, yeah, I agree. But this, this does feel like PC gone way too far to me. Like, this is my opinion alone. Like, there are many contributors to Node, right? Yes. So holding one man or one small group of people accountable or holding the project accountable to them is – it just seems really, really hard to me. And I'm having – like I don't like Node for lots of reasons that have nothing to do with this complaint. Sure. Right? You don't like it as a technology is what you're saying there. I, I think it's morally bankrupt from a technological perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, it does se- it does seem that – I don't know. I'm a little bit torn. I'm not. I'm. I'm more positive on note. I've had a lot of reservations about it. Uh, I like it mostly for my own selfish reasons and as in it as a platform to target. Um, oh, I use it all the time. I mean, yeah, right. Yeah. It turns out it, it it can be useful even if it feels gross as, at the same like time. Like dirt, dirty little secret. Alice is written on note. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's everywhere all the time, and we just can't we just can't escape JavaScript. That's just how it works. Um, and it, it seems like it should be good, right? Like it, uh, what, it's now under the, the Linux Foundation or the open source? What what foundation is it under? It started at Joyent. Um, I thought it was the open source foundation. Yeah. But I might be wrong. Um, and so like that seemed good. And I would want it to have a good gov- governance model. So I guess where my concerns would be like, are it, is, it, is this person powerful enough to interfere with like the healthy self-governance of the project? That I could see being a problem. Um, I, I wouldn't want like political views. It would be more like the things I would care about are more like, like personal conduct and the, you know, like, how do you, do do you, are you allowing the community to, to flourish? Okay. I don't like the idea though of the software community turning and saying that you will be tried for things you've said, but not yet done. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, definitely. Definitely. Like, um, if you haven't actually... Yeah, action, actions are what count here. To some extent, uh, you know, sure, like, t- tone maybe can be considered in some situations, but it, not not with the same weight as, like, actual actions or inactions. But, but, I mean, you've been on plenty of podcasts, and I've recorded 278 episodes of this show. There is someone in every race, creed, religion, gender, orientation that has somehow been insulted by me. Oh, right? yeah, absolutely. Be- because I'm a jackass. I was really. offended, like, I- six times last episode alone. Yeah, we've been doing a triple header today. I'm sure you're ready to choke me. So, does that mean, like, if I give you a pull request that fix your system, you have to reject it because I'm a bad guy in your from your perspective? Like, that seems crazy to me. Yeah, and I think... Given I, that words are not actions, right? Yes. No, and I and I, I think you're right about that. Where, I, where it gets maybe more dicey is in, like, when you, like, who speaks for the project or, uh, you know, how that interfaces with, like, I guess I would just try to view it through the lens of pragmatism in terms of like what's best for the the project and is someone being actively harmful either against it or against the ability for it to function. But I'm not, it's not necessarily clear that that's what's happening in the case. And that's like the worst part about this whole thing is it's just so vague. It's not really clear what's going on. All the thing that I've been able to be convinced of is that it seems like the node uh, community governance is a mess and maybe it has been for a long time. And I think that's fair. These problems didn't happen overnight, right? They didn't show up last Tuesday. Yeah. Like they, they've been they've been brewing. It's like a good pot of coffee. 
Yeah, and and so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where it's going to go. Right, there was the previous uh, I/O JS fork that ended up well, be going yeah. back into Node. Yeah, Node has been forked and like recombined a few times. Right, Node Node has managed the Node maintainers have managed to stand up to a lot of challenges before, and. I I'm not con- I would not bet against those guys, right? I right. think they'll they'll hold up. And the one thing that about Node, and and I guess as a subset of JavaScript, is just the, the momentum, right? Like it's not the most beautiful, it's not the most technically correct or justified, but it just has sheer mass of humans, and so it just well, keeps on. Right. The Microsoft Bot Framework has a giant interface on Node.js. Yes. Right. Like you have companies like that, like Microsoft, backing you. Yeah. Whatever you think of Microsoft, whatever you think of the Node maintainers. That is a lot. That, that is, is a, a lot. Like no, like uh, West says, that's a huge, huge amount of momentum. I mean, it, at least as far as I can tell, it's sort of like you know, like the old sort of like, well, you know, if there's an API for it, there's going to be a Java implementation. Now it's there's a Java and a Node implementation. If it can be written in JavaScript, it will. It, it, yeah, exactly. So I guess we'll just have to play, um, wait and see, uh, or maybe not, because Mike, it, it might be time to kill the web. What do you think? You know what? I cannot deny that my heart has long desired the web to burn in fire. Go back but to a simpler time of uh, a bulletin time. boards and simple BBX plain T- TC- TCP a, connections. A world without ad networks. Ooh. Now, now we're, we're talking. Yeah, right? now I'm interested. But we love our sponsors on the oh, show. Oh, yes, of course we do. Absolutely we do. <laughs> Completely clear. Um, a world... Of native applications, native that do, do not have the egregious memory overhead that, let's say, Electron or web apps have. But but I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to like learn a native language for that, aren't I? I know. Do you know what that means? You have to specialize. So you have to pick a side. You can't mm. just say, "Oh, I write." Mm, now we're talking. Now we are talking. Now- but. This fellow has a lot of good arguments in his uh, in his uh, essay here about the web should die. Unfortunately, none of them matter. Huh. Let me tell you why. Wes. Why is that? Economics, or as I call them, Reaganomics. The market always goes to the cheapest, the cheapest technology with the widest coverage, meaning that the most platforms, the most use, really the most users at the lowest initial development cost. That's what the technology, that's what the market always bends to. And we've seen this over and over again. Why does Cordova exist? Because people want to hit iOS and Android at the cheapest possible. Why do floppy, why did floppy piece of shit this beat, um, what were the other, I forgot the other ones. Um, oh my God, the big disc. One's after it. What? I mean, I mean CD-ROMs. CD-ROMs. Why does CD-ROMs beat the other drives? What were they called? Mega? I, I forgot the name of the disk yeah. drive, but someone will write into the show. Because CD-ROMs were cheaper, right? Yeah, we've seen time and time again, uh, the best technology usually doesn't win. It's it's just whatever whatever gets whatever gets adoption, whatever's cheap. Uh, there you go. Betamax, VHS. Yeah. So, like in that same vein, right? It's it's that same. Um, we were talking about React Native um, on a previous show, and so it's that same kind of argument, right? If you can hire someone who can make your, um, he can make your website or she, uh, they can make your Electron desktop app, and they can make your React Native app, and that's like two people that you've had to hire instead of three separate specialized teams. Well, and the maintenance cost, you would imagine that the engines of these apps have a ton of cross uh, cross coverage, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. So. I really want this dude to be right. I, ca- I can't express that enough. And I think Chris does too, Wes. I don't, where do you fall on this web versus uh, native technologies? We've never asked. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn because, you know, like in this article, uh, Mike Heem here over at blog.plan99.net, uh, you know, one of the things he talked about is that we're slowly reinventing the 1990s. And he's not, that's not wrong. Um, that's definitely true. So I'm a little torn because... Kinda- Sorry, go on. No, that's that kind of sad clarity that only Jin can bring you, but keep going. Yeah, oh, yeah, God, I love Jin. Um, but I, I'm torn because I'm also like, I'm I'm a Linux user through and through. I don't really have any non-Linux systems at this point. Uh, I have a Windows machine I game on occasionally. All right, full full 
full disclosure uh, there. And the truth comes out. And the truth comes out. But honestly, I haven't powdered on for a while, so uh, you know, I'm, oh. I'm I'm good. Okay, just just believe me. <laughs> I quit, man. I got. I quit. I swear, shit. I'm clean. Um, but regardless, I'm pretty invested in this whole Linux open source operating system thing. So from that perspective, the web, the whole shift to the web has been advantageous because at least up to this point, the popular web browsers and the open standards of the web, or at least relatively open, have meant that Linux got to play too. Sure, there were some things like when Silverlight was popular, Flash was was a pain. Um, it took Netflix a long time to get to, to Linux, but it did happen. And by and large, like I can, I can hand my mom a Linux laptop and since mostly what she does is play Facebook Scrabble, uh, it works just fine. Whereas that might not have been the case with native apps. Um, even myself, like I'm tempted by React Native and Electron for that same reason, because like, well, I've had to learn some web skills just because who doesn't in this world? Uh, and I want to be able to transfer them, but I don't, uh, I, ha- I have done some C++, but I haven't done any Qt work. So I couldn't, it would take me a lot longer to get go bootstrap, let's say a native Qt Linux app. Okay, first of all, cute is a goddamn nightmare, but keep going. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but that's, so that, so that's where I fall. I'm torn because I do have the kind of, like, practical angle of, like, well, this seems like a lot of bloat and a lot of abstraction when, like, we could be doing this with radically simpler tools. But those simpler tools are simple in some ways, but they're also a lot lower level in other ways. And at some point, like, I just want to enable this new thing. I don't necessarily care about... I'm really good at understanding the windowing system. So is that not, am I on the opposite side? I don't know. I'm not sure. You you very adeptly played both sides on yeah, that. Argument. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. But don't you think, let me just make the Reaganomics argument. This is not necessarily my opinion. Sure. Yeah. But that memory is so cheap and development time is still relatively expensive that having a solution that can run, maybe not perfectly, maybe not with all the glitz and glam on any platform is better than having a perfect solution on one or two platforms. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I do think at the end of the day, that's that's what's that's what's going to win, because like we can we can we can gripe and moan about Electron all we want. And we should, because there can be there can be better embedded node applications or whatever. Right. Like Electron is not the be all end all of packaged JS desktop runtime. No, but it's effectively the standard. Yes, right? exactly. Like, um, and I think it's a trend that we'll continue to see. Um, but yeah, it's it's just it's just too practical. And RAM has gotten so cheap. CPUs are cheap enough. And then a lot of the business cases for this too, like you know, if you're thinking of things like things like Slack, for instance, that's just not a problem. People will run it. People will install it. It's not that different. They they don't care. The end user doesn't see it. And so the relatively few of us. Uh, you know the peer peer minded developers, the sys admins out there who are who are bemoaning the bloat. Like all of those are legitimate arguments, but it's just not it's just not going to sway the people who end up making the those calls. The only argument I see that works is the moral degradation of junior and intern developers. You know the youth, right? Protect the youth. Yes. In that they're not writing Objective C or small talk. Yeah, that's true. I'm glad you agree. I expected an argument there, but I didn't get one. No. All right. Well, well, I mean, maybe rephrase it. What, what did you? What do you mean by that? So, okay. I mean, I was making my normal Mike loves obviously. Of course, joke, yes, but, uh, yes, obviously. But there, there is an argument to be said that by not learning how to code an application to your actual platform, encoding to these like wild abstractions such as Electron you are in some way disadvantaging yourself on understanding how the actual system works, right? Yeah. Like, you know what? NS Notification Center, not the weird new version, but the old ass version from Snow Leopard and yes. basically every version of Mac except for the except for High Sierra, is actually a really interesting, really smart way to do cross uh, cross class communications in an application. But, you know, if you're on Electron yeah, you don't get that, right? <laughs> like, it doesn't exist. I mean, you can do some interesting stuff with notifications, but those are user notifications, not not internal app notifications, not key value response, not KVO, not anything like that. Right. Um, GCD. I'm, I'm going to get a little Mac heavy here because that's, you know, that's, I'm going back. I'm going back. I'm going back. I'm to going your back roots. To 
you know, Grand Central Dispatch, which was released in the one true operating system, Snow Leopard, <laughs> is probably the most masterful piece of technology I have ever seen. And yet, Electron doesn't expose the end developer to that at all. Which, I mean, I think the Electron guys would say, well, that's a feature, right? He doesn't have to understand GCD. He doesn't have to understand development, or she, obviously. But learning GCD was like a milestone for me, right? Understanding how that worked, understanding OBSI blocks and how they are basically, you know, passed around function objects and understanding how inter- how Objective-C can interop with C and C++ on a different thread th- through GCD to perform complex uh, calculations and then bring them back to the main thread to render them in the UI was a kind of a big deal. And just abstracting that into some, you know, async await, which is a new hotness that JavaScript wants to get from the oh, .NET yeah, yeah. or whatever other abstraction you want to have. I'm not saying we shouldn't have it because given the choice, I would use the abstraction. Right. But I'm saying that there there is a value right there's a it's like exercise like physical exercise like i've been walking a mile every day for for about a week and a half now there's a value in doing the work i think at the at at least the platform metal level right so for mac it's coco for linux it's a little harder because there's no one true bliss platform but i would argue it's like gtk and something else um for windows it's pretty easy you should be writing uh you know uh windows um Oh God! Windows platform applications, right? Universe UWP applications, right? And learning the dynamics and the idioms of the platform, Electron takes that all away. It, it seems like that uh, you know that strikes me that it it it's sort of an argument we make a lot uh, just in in computer science, right? Like some people will argue that there's value today in learning um, assembly, for instance. Like that, that's a pretty radical radical difference. But right, but you take folks my older than me would right, folks older than me would criticize me for not really understanding assembly. Correct, yeah. and it and it's it seems to me that like those those edge cases, right? So like where you because you understand the lower level. Um, that you can you understand where things break down, where the abstractions are leaky, um, and you have some more insight into that instead of the person who doesn't and just sort of has to be like, well, this is my abstraction broke down. I only know the abstraction, so I'm I'm kind of helpless. So that's obviously correct, but I would I would add a couple like points to that. One, the abstraction will leak at any level. That's true, yeah. right? There's always some amount of leak. But I would say there's a direct correlation between how high altitude of the extraction and the amount of liquid, quote, the volume of the <laughs> So Coco is an abstraction, right? Let's just use my Mac example, yes. my Mac developer from, uh, you know, circa 2007 here, or 2008, whatever year Snow Leopard was released. Coco is an abstraction, sure. Because, you know, what? a Mac machine really is BSD. People might bitch and moan and say it's not, but it really is. Yeah, mock, mock is kernel, BSD, user land, there you go. That's what it is, right? Like uh, it is what it is. Coco is an abstraction on that. Now the abstractions in Coco aren't that bad, I would argue. But and there's a weird part where Coco has links into Carbon, which is another abstraction. Right. But let's ignore Carbon completely because Carbon's if you're doing legacy. Let's say you're just doing Coco. That's great. Now you have something else. Um that is abstracting Coco away, which is abstracting the, the, the mock kernel, which is abstracting the... Mo- How many the, uh, layers up are we right. here? Yeah. And now you're getting Electron, which is V8, plus an abstraction on top of V8, which is abstracting all these other things that we've just talked about away on top of that. My argument, and this is my theory on abstractions, is the higher up, the more, the more you increase the altitude on the abstraction, the more volume of liquid the leak. And I know that sounds silly, but think about it. The further you are from the actual system, the more – it's like a, the butterfly effect, right? The more a little error, the more damage a little error will cause. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Like, And so it becomes very important like how, how frequent those are, uh, how – you know how it doesn't matter when you have one; it's like your damn damn break. So it becomes important, like, well, how often how often does that that happen? But but it certainly it certainly does happen. And when you are like a thousand feet up, and suddenly you're getting like an assembler stack trace, you're sort of like, well, this doesn't this doesn't mean anything to me, and I can't reasonably reason about what my program is doing without understanding the three different abstractions in between. And now suddenly I've done all the work that I was claiming I didn't have to do. 
Right. Like I, I, when we started the show, uh, Wes, I was originally a pretty, pretty native only kind of guy. Yeah. Then I turned because, the, and, and I still believe that the market in most cases won't accept a native solution. It wants a cross platform web based solution. Right. Or but, you would have to put in extra work compared to your competitors to present a seamless solution. And you would lose money. And you would right. lose money. Like, yeah, exactly. You're just right. less competitive. But, at the end of the day, I think for people trying to learn, which is what a lot of the listeners of the show are, you know, if you have a Mac, Coco is one of the most beautiful, best APIs to program to, in my opinion. You know, I have consistently heard that, like from from yeah. way different channels. That that has been one consistent fact. I mean, Swift perverts it a little bit because it tries to make it more protocol oriented, but just do OPC or C plus plus, and it is, or even straight C, it is really good and i would argue and this is going to be some heat from the net folks that it is the same size or it at least covers the same scope as most of net was before microsoft drank the kool-aid and became hippies <laughs> but it is a much cleaner much more easy to reason about api um so i i, I would actually say that like Coco is a great API to learn application development on because it, it has rules and it makes sense and it makes you think in a certain way. And the ways Coco makes you think are easily transferable to almost anywhere. Yeah, that that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. And and that like uh, I mean there are just like some fundamentals of like um, graphical application development that like you need to learn because right. at some level they all work basically the same way whether it's React components well, or it's Cocoa right. things. I mean, at the end of the day, OpenGL is OpenGL. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, here I see uh, like a uh, Node.js Objective C bridge or other things. Madness. Would you? How would you feel if? So you weren't using Electron. What about a Node app that? called out to coco to do all of its hard work would you hate it would you use it would you tolerate it i'm having a very visceral emotional reaction to this um <laughs> it's my job to provoke you that's what i'm here for i don't think that's a good idea <laughs> yeah okay that's you know fair. What? yeah i mean if you want to do a web app i i kind of think you should just be in cordova and do a web app right or mm -hmm. electron or you know mobiles cordova but you know, the idea of you like somehow transpiling or whatever into Coco or into OBC or C++ or whatever seems like, do you remember ActiveX? Wex? Oh remember yeah, ActiveX? I do. <laughs> I wish it's I did. starting didn't. to feel a little familiar. Doesn't it like native access from the browser? Yes. No? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that scares me. I, I have a visceral, very negative reaction to that sort of thing. Like if you want to be native, be native. If you want to be web, be web. Pick a lane. Pick yeah, pick a lane. Uh, they have they have different standards. They have different expectations, uh, and maybe different it's best to understand different them. cost structures. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And it seems like there will always be the, um, you know, room for that native app that can take advantage. Like there's some apps where maybe the native integration doesn't matter as much. You know, it's just like, we just want to do this. The native stuff just helps it make it easier to, you know, you have a file menu now and that's kind of helpful. Um, or we can pull files files from your file system. Um, and then there's some apps that are like high performance or can really take advantage of like the native, you know, native opportunities to have have more value add. And it seems like there, there's always, as long as we have native platforms that have actual differentiations, we're always going to need that class of program whether or not there's actually a reasonable market for it, I think that's what we're watching happen. And it doesn't, right. it seems like that's just going to keep shrinking. Right. I, I the mainstream market is going to go away. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, exactly. So if that is the case, and I think, I think we're pretty sure that it is the case. Just, just get on the web already. Uh, start writing web apps. You're going to need somewhere to host them. I'm pretty sure. So just head on over to digitalocean.com. Just do it right now. Come on, digitalocean.com. It's easy to type. It's real quick. Go there. Use our promo code, which is coder digital. All one word, lowercase, coder digital. That, after you sign up, that'll get you a $10 credit. And with that $10 credit, you can spin up a VPS of your very own in under 55 seconds. What are you going to get there? Well, you're going to get some of the best bandwidth on the internet. They've got 40 gigabit right to the KVM 
hypervisor. It's running, it's running Linux. You know that. Plus, have you ever seen DigitalOcean's data centers? Like, go, go to their blog. Go check out what they're working on. They've got an Instagram, all the social media. They have immaculate data centers. They're beautiful. And you, they're, they're opening new ones like every day. There's Frankfurt, Toronto, New York, San Francisco, all over the place. A data center near you for sure. There, you can spin up a droplet of your own, right? So starting at $5 a month, you get 512 MB of memory, one virtual CPU, 20 gigs of all SSD disk, and a whopping one terabyte of transfer. Now, me... I love that DigitalOcean transfer. They've got great peering, great transit. Frequently, my own ISP. I'm not going to mention them here because it just that just won't help. But sometimes I'm frustrated. Sometimes I want to download something from Europe and it's just too slow. DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean does not have that problem. They've got great transit. So go download it. Go proxy through DigitalOcean Droplet. DigitalOcean Droplet, it's great for it's great for a VPN. It's great for just something to run the cron jobs need to happen. Host your IRC bouncer. Host your blog, WordPress, CMS system, whatever you want. Now, they've got, they've got attachable block storage, also SSD. They've got object storage, brand new. Go check it out. Spaces. They've got monitoring, cloud firewalls, load balancers, High CPU droplets, all the features you want, plus a freaking fantastic API, just just fantastic, awesome web dashboard, super simple, super easy to use. You you won't be bamboozled about what the prices are. You won't be bamboozled about what your options are. It's just developer focused, super simple, and it's like fifty five seconds. Do you have fifty five seconds? I have fifty five seconds. I'm doing a podcast right now live. I have 55 seconds to just go spin up a droplet while Mike's talking, spin it up, have a new have a new droplet going, already doing backups to it. That's how easy it is. So don't waste your time. Don't waste our time. Head on over to DigitalOcean.com. Use our promo code, Coder Digital, and get started today. And thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. Ah, okay, so now that I'm done having fun at DigitalOcean... We can move on because uh, maybe it's time to kill the web, but it's not dead yet. You're probably going to go to a website to listen to this here podcast. I heard, just maybe, that uh, you've got some new uh, IT automation tips, Mr. Dominic. I do. Now, the Coda Radio audience is very with it. So these might seem a little, you know, a little easy for them, but... You know, I know we have managers listening, and they deny, 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 but I know they're there. I know it. So and there's no, is, not that there's anything wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And you know, being a manager is is like selling your soul to the devil. I mean, it's a great thing to do. Yeah, I'm I mean, a people. Manager. Yeah, people need managers. Turns out, people need you know tasks assigned and uh, people to yell at them when they're not doing their work. It's a thing you need. So, all right, top three uh, T automation tips. Now, there's a bonus too, but we won't talk about those. All right, so you know what you can automate? Status updates. You can write a bot. You can write a script, basically, that emails or Slack or Microsoft Link or Google Messages all your status updates to the stakeholders and other project managers. This sounds silly if you're not a PM or if you're not responsible for client communications, but status updates are a huge pain in the ass. And so is this triggered off like Jira cards? What do, what what are the like things that, that So you put can this trigger emotion? off a off a sprint in let's say Jira being closed. Or you can trigger off a date, which is far more helpful, I think. Uh, okay. It's like every Friday at six PM you trigger this. Okay. And it will go like pull from various sources, whatever the exactly. current Jira, GitHub, whatever you have. So is that showing things like, hey, these things were all these were all done, or these commits these were are made? QA, yep. Yeah, these packages were promoted, whatever. Yep. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that does actually seem like it would be pretty helpful. Just one less thing you have to think about if the software, if the, the systems in the back end can do it and can just go give transparent reports, you can just keep working. Exactly. The next one is regression testing. So the more complicated a, a software project becomes, the more likely something in the future that you didn't think would affect this old feature that was tested and accepted is going to actually affect <laughs> that feature, right? Yes. That's where automated regression testing comes in. You have tests, they run. You can use things like Jenkins or Bitbucket Pipelines or um, 
I mean, there's a bunch. Microsoft has one. There's a whole pile of them. That basically every time you do a merge request into specific branches or even a push, if you're that aggressive, run all your tests and they can either, in the case of a pull request, reject the pull request right. if the tests don't pass. That is a huge deal. I mean, it requires the upfront investment of running the tests, but it can save you a lot of heartache in customer or stakeholder demos. Do you have any tips on regret, like developing a good regression test suite? You know, I have, I've always found the best thing to do with a regression test is write it as a unit test for the feature at the time the feature was written and never change it when other features are, are added there we go. unless they really interact with the feature. Because the reason is you want it to be as rigid and stringent to the one feature it cares about as possible, right? You don't want it to have any flexibility. Right. You want it to map directly to what the customer's experience right. is, that the feature one, they understand. One. One feature, one test, right? One user facing feature, one test. That's it. Awesome. Nothing else. And the next one is pretty easy. Wes, you've said it, or maybe I've, I've definitely said it. Hey, it worked on my machine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Automated deployments. This will test if the app runs on other machines other than the guy submitting the pull request. So you're talking here like um like spin up like a QA or other environment where you go you go do a deploy and then maybe run like right. some sort of I mean, sanity you, test. You, right. If you're using DO, it can just spin it up real fast. Boom. Right? Yeah. But or if you're I mean, there's other ways to do this, but it's um the idea here is that no one should ever get away again, ever, ever. Remember, you're the manager in this case, right? With it worked on my machine. Right. Every pull request. Every I would just say every push on this one. And it, and it seems like that one is helpful too to make sure like to do that, to execute against that goal, you have to have an understanding of what your infrastructure looks like um, so that you can, you know, make sure that it's replicated, that you can, that you can test it. Well, most people are targeting specific devices or the web, right? Yep. So you can run a machine that, I mean, most people are talking like Node, Rails, PHP. I mean, it's not hard to, I mean, the dirty little secret about this stuff is if you use Docker, this all becomes yeah, a lot easier definitely. because you can have an image of what your production environment looks like and redeploy instances of that to run these tests on and then decommission them again automatically with the DigitalOcean API and pay like 50 cents for this whole process or less and be good to go. Right. I just meant like it might encourage you to do things like, well, in our production servers, we spun up a droplet by hand and we installed the packages and then put the code on it but like if you Already if you have to go and you know do for testing you're like well we had to you know be able to automate so, a, a server like there you go yeah so then you're already wrong right you need to automate your your server spin up whether you're doing it with docker images or something like a vagrant or, or ansible you don't you don't want to be like sshing into a server and running apt get and installing packages right no snowflakes no, no beautiful snowflakes. Everybody, you know what? All these servers are Russian infantry in World War II, right? Just march them into the line of fire. Yeah, there wow. we go. You're lucky if you get any grain this year. Wow. Comrade. So <laughs> hardcore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. That's that's great. I think that um, like these are important things too. Like It's important for developers to understand, but I think you're right too. Like man- Managers need to understand those things because there's a lot of externalities that affect how developers work, how productive they are, how reliable they are that like are not just strictly like technology things they're almost like process questions as well right and that's one thing like i think like managers product managers etc like you ne- there needs to be a holistic understanding of the development workflow to be able to to continually deliver reliable and good software i haven't seen a piece of good software since snow leopard 10.6 2008 boom roasted shows over Woo! ouch yeah okay but i mean you're not it's not like you're it's not like you're wrong. Uh, software is terrible, and we all wish that we didn't that we didn't have to deal with it. At least, at least I That's wish true. that. Software is the worst part of your computer, really. Yeah. Like, okay, so um, the the one thing people think like sometimes that's worse than software, uh, it, it's the hardware. Um, oh, but and, and what that makes me think of is this. Um, this trend towards serverless. I just keep seeing more and more about serverless technology. I know you've talked about it um, a fair bit right here on this program. 
I have. Um, so I have lots of thoughts on this. But you know what? You are the lord of functional programming. You're the lord of closure, closure script. What do you think of serverless? Because in many ways, I feel like those things are connected. Yeah, you know, I guess the, I guess, so. What do you see as what do you see as the connection? So, <laughs> excuse me. Functional programming is trying to be stateless, right? Yes. And as a serverless architecture, and I have found in my own use, that the best way to take advantage of our serverless architecture is to, frankly, use functional programming and be stateless. To not have, like, traditional... I mean, traditional, I'm defining it as, like, Java applications and Rails, right? Yes. I'm talking... It, the, the language doesn't really matter, but I'm doing a lot of JavaScript, which can be, I will defend this to the end, a good functional language, but also a lot of F-sharp, which is, like, a more... Uh, oh, I more didn't know you've been doing F-sharp. I have been doing quite a bit of F-sharp for data processing. That's really interesting. It's okay. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's, it, it is what it is, right? It works. I mean, I'm coming to the point where it's actually not as pure functional as I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And I'm having to impose the same kind of uh, sort of self-restrictions that I do when I write JavaScript to make it functional. But it is, it's fast, it's good. And it works on Azure Functions, which is where I have my uh, my serverless architecture hosted. Right, right. So. I, I think I think like some of the things you're getting there is that uh, you know serverless it makes you think about like we all end up writing apps that depend on the server that you run, whether you're lo you're logging to um, you know the file system there. Uh, you're you're saving documents there. You're interacting with it. You're depending on save state or local caches or other things. Um, unless you're really writing like a twelve factor style app, you're 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 dependent on those. And a lot of times those are implicit dependencies. And so when you go to serverless, where you're like, well, you get three hundred seconds, uh, and you can't count on anything, and we're going to reset you up in a brand new environment. Um, you're forced to you're forced to make those dependencies explicit. Um, I think I think that has a lot to be said about it, just in trying to create understandable. Um, simple software i think that, that makes what, yeah i think what's interesting is like trying to decide what the what the trade-off is and where um you know kind of like what you were just hitting at right like you can have some environments that make you do that and force you to go through that and you can also to some extent just do that by your own force of will and in your own environment so you can certainly write um relatively stateless java web services if you want to it's not always done um and you might not have to have to do it that way um, and then it becomes, then, then what gets interesting to me is this, like, um, you know, how do we manage services, services, what kind of incidental complexity can we remove? Because I've certainly seen, I've dealt a lot recently with, um, like development teams that previously had a really strong ops team to rely on, uh, almost to the point where at some points, like this ops team was responsible for deployments even. So developers would make a release, that ops team would then go and actually do the deployments and handle all of the stuff on the, on the production servers. Um, they're now in a position where they have to have to manage these production servers themselves, and and to them it's a lot of like, well, we don't really care, right? Like we're trying to we're trying to write the application, we don't care about this, and so it seems like serverless helps there too, maybe, um, in that you you because you don't have all these implicit things, and you're presented a little bit of a simpler interface. You just say like, yep, okay, here's my little Node.js bundle, here's my Docker container, you start it up. I'm subscribed to your APIs. That's where my data comes from. That's where I push my data out to. And then I can just work on the actual algorithms and business logic. I think that makes a ton of sense, right? You, and, th and that's the whole idea. You're working on the actual algorithm of, for the problem you're trying to solve. You're not worried about infrastructure or kind of the ceremony around that. Yeah. What, what I'm, one thing I'm interested in in this space is like, to what extent sometimes, and I come from it from a, um, like I have a pretty good systems background. I've done, you know, I've done a lot of Linux work. I'm pretty comfortable with that. Um, I've also done development. So I might be someone that, you know, can straddle that divide better than others, or I'm more interested in the, the system stuff than a lot of people. So for me, sometimes a system is simpler. And a lot of times I see, like in particular working with, with AWS, other things is that, it's not that you aren't still doing a lot of systems management or, you know, complex orchestration. It's just that you have different APIs now. And yes, some of them are nicer. Like some of them are now like REST interfaces or I can just 
spit JSON at them and get JSON back, and that works nicer than having to work with like Unix text style streams, etc. Um, but at some level, it's sort of like some level, it's kind of the same, or it's it's almost as much work to do it that way as it is to just hey, I have some servers and it runs now. So at what point does serverless become a hindrance in your mind? Or it, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, and it, it might even be... I think it can go both ways. I, I almost want like someone with more time should make this but like a like a phase diagram you know like uh, if you're thinking about like when water boils and freezes i want one of those for serverless for like because i feel like there's like there's some areas in the low volume simple project where like yeah i just set this up and i don't have to worry about my infrastructure uh where serverless makes sense and then i think there's also a bubble on the other side where you're in like super scale uh and you can just let your serverless provider handle the kind of horizontal scaling for you that it also makes sense but maybe somewhere in the middle ground there's a region of running your own infrastructure um where it's where it's more pragmatic but where those boundaries are i think we're still kind of trying to to figure out one thing i would like to try more is uh things like um have you heard of like open fast f-a-a-s um a serverless framework that? for Docker and Kubernetes. So it's basically like like um, Azure Functions or Lambdas for AWS, but for Kubernetes or other similar open source things you could deploy on your own cloud if you were building one. Oh, that's super interesting. I mean, I found that the serverless uh, sort of idea coupled with functional programming has let me get away with just offsetting or rather off relocating intensive but you know kind of singular data processing processes onto these like lambda or or azure functions right aws lambda or azure functions yeah exactly and i think that's right like where where a lot of it can shine or at least has so far is exactly that where you view your program as a composition of data processing steps and that's one thing where functional programming really shines because it you know it really especially especially i'd say closure but like you know, it forces you to think about like data first and what you're doing is you start with some start data and you apply a series of transformations and at the end you have the computed product of whatever you're doing. Um, and so when you can have this sort of callbacked or streamed sort of system where, yes, okay, well, you hit my API gateway, that triggered this this function which transformed it, this sent it over here to my database or to my NoSQL system or it now it got indexed and then that triggered further updates down the line. Um one thing I haven't seen a ton yet is is how do we control all of that? You know, like if you need to trigger, um, like you have a Lambda, let's say, and you need to, you know, you want to spin off a whole bunch of other Lambdas, but you want to, you want to trigger, you want to be able to like watch them or you want something to happen when you're done. Like I think there's a lot of this, um, you know, with stateless comes some additional challenges in terms of orchestration and um, synchronization. I think it'll be interesting to see what kind of tools and frameworks evolve. Like we have these new abstractions, but to some extent they're not quite, they're a little low, a little too low level uh, some of the time to be put together nicely. Now that makes a ton of sense. I mean, it, it's all about balancing the benefits and the risks of the abstraction, right? Will the abstraction leak? Like we talked about, I think it was what one or two episodes ago. Or will the time saving from using the abstraction outweigh any potential leak? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, so before we go on, because this is all very interesting, but I do want to make sure we take time out. And uh, if you're like serverless, serverless, what is serverless? I want to I want to talk servers. You know what? It turns out I still want to talk servers too. And where I go to learn about servers and where I send people that want to learn about how to run a server, there's only one source and that's linux academy so head on over linuxacademy.com slash coders oh yeah so there at linux academy you can get started on one of the premier places to learn about linux open source technologies devops aws uh you know what they've even got information on lambda so if you do want to go learn about serverless linux academy is a great place to go so just go join now you can start with a free trial you get unlimited access to courses six cloud servers hands-on labs and exercises that's one of the huge features so instead of having to go figure out how aws works which 
is a whole thing unto itself, go to Linux Academy, start learning about AWS. They will handle all the backend stuff. You don't have to pay for it. You don't. Put, you give your credit card to Linux Academy for a fixed price. You don't get billed with Amazon's crazy secret pricing. You just... It's just simple. They spin it up. They front that for you. You go log into the server, do your lessons, learn the lessons without having to worry about it. I mean, it's been so useful countless times because like a lot of times you're trying to play with something for work. Maybe it's a hack week. Maybe you don't want to go spend uh, you know, way too much of work's money on on your test uh, Elastic Beanstalk a- application. Go learn about it on Linux Academy. They've got that all figured out for you. Whatever platform you're deploying on, be that you know Red Hat or Ubuntu, Debian, etc., they will customize the courseware for you. If you're super pressed for time, they've got awesome nuggets, which are just little lessons, mini lessons, super crunchy, delicious mini lessons. Focus on one small topic. What's great about them is it's they're short enough in time, and there's a good there's a good variation there, but they're short enough on time that you can just sit down in whatever free time you have and come away having learned something, right? Now you know that one new fact, and you can be sure because of the way Linux Academy works, it's it's hyper focused on Linux and open source DevOps technologies. It, they're not going to teach you underwater basket weaving. They're not going to teach you how to uh, make a canoe from from wood. Those are just not. It's not in their scope. Because of that, they can specialize. Right? We talked about. We've talked about that already today. They can. They can specialize. They can have additional value add because they really care. They use this technology to build Linux Academy itself. They are all. Linux and open source experts, and it really shows in the community. There's a community full of Jupyter Broadcasting members. They've got instructor-led lessons, instructor mentoring. Uh, so you really get that human touch when you need it to make sure that you understand, you get that presented in just the right way. I know sometimes when you're learning a complex topic, just having it reframed in a slightly different context really helps. And that's one of the ways Linux Academy shines. So head on over, linuxacademy.com slash coders. That lets them know you appreciate them sponsoring the Coder Radio program. I know I do. Ah, okay, Mr. Dominic. Now that we've all learned about serverless. Hang on, I'm still spinning up a few droplets. Ah, you're Don't spinning up a few droplets. Okay, well, I, how do I... With bl- Linux Academy's Docker lesson, of course. Boom. I merge the sponsors. They're all one now. Super, super we- sponsor merge. I don't want to say it's like Ultron, I think I mean Voltron, don't I? Yes, I think you do. Oh, damn. Huh. Okay, so... I ruined that. You were a little down on Node.js earlier in the show. I wanted to bring this around and ask you about it. Um, so I, I think a lot what, what a lot of people found about Node.js was just this whole async API that was available to them and the simple, um, you know, like in some ways maybe it's easier to take a take a developer and teach them how to use Node's async API than it was to teach them how to do, let's say, Java threading correctly. Um, what what do you do? You agree with that? Do you disagree? And also, what are your what are your Node.js like? What don't you like about it? What might you like about it? So that's that's a very big question. Um, let me. Okay, so. Node does not solve a new problem, right? There is no application that you could build in Node today that you couldn't build before. Yeah, I agree. And that's been true for years, right? We've been talking about Node for a while. The problem for me is people, particularly the Node community, just waves that criticism off and says, well, who cares? Well, enterprises care, right? The military cares. People who hold their enterprise their applications for five to 10 years care a lot about that sort of problem. Why should they change? Um, and to me, that is a sinkable indictment by itself. Because I would go the next step, and not only can is there not a new application that you couldn't build before, but Node is not materially better than all of the alternatives. Um, I mean, I can make arguments as to why it's better than maybe Rails. Right. But even then, Rails has a lot of advantages over node in a lot of different areas if you're just trying to get shit done yeah right and if, uh, if you're building a, t- 10k right. processes uh our 10k connections aren't aren't your concern or if you're right and if you're just building like one big monolithic application right yes um so that's that's my criticism of node and then i come back to reality and 
everybody loves Node. Everybody's using Node. And why are they using Node? Because it's it's ubiquitous, right? Yes. I mean, uh, JavaScript, people have to learn JavaScript anyway to do browser work. And as we know, the web is, is everything now. Um, long live the web. And so people already know it. And so they can leverage those skills. NPM uh, has, and now Yarn have, have crazy momentum, thousands of libraries. I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm not convinced that that's a feature though. No, I'm not, I'm not either, but it does, it is one of those, um, those like practical things that, that end up swaying people, even if it's not for a good reason. Because right. my, my general feeling on Node is it's really easy to get started with something relatively simple. And then the scalability in terms of maintenance cost, no one, hit, I mean, I have not been convinced that the maintenance cost of Node aren't either the same or higher than something like, say, Rails, right? Yeah. Or, say, Java Spring or Spring Boot or whatever. And in hell, even ASP uh, MVC uh, or yeah. ASP Core. Sure. So it's kind of a loaded question. I don't mean to, like, dodge your question, but if Node can't do anything different fundamentally, if it has no clear cost advantage over the other, because you know what, the lie of having your server and front end language being the same would be a feature. No one's doing that, right? That is just not happening in production. Even if they're both JavaScript, the front end applications very much separate. Then what's the point? What is the advantage of changing from what you're already doing or to something that may be a little more appropriate for your environment? over node like what why I, I i the why has never been fundamental to me it's never been solid enough for me to to say node is the next big thing even though node has done a great job of taking over market share it sure has yeah no i see that too a little bit in that like um people are like oh this async stuff's really cool but haven't necessarily gotten to the point where they're like well i need to start thinking about async because i need to be efficient and uh low latency or or, or whatever their problem is um Whereas at the end of the day, like, I think, uh, what is the, uh, is it a guy steal quote? The, you know, like programs should be written for humans to read and only incidentally for computers to execute. And like a lot of the time it's like, well, I just need this to be simple and maintainable and we can deal with performance when we can't afford to buy more server or more RAM for it. Or that's our, that's our biggest problem. Sure. But also like node, if, if performance is your only concern, node, maybe isn't your first choice, right? You might look at going old school with something like C++ or Perl or... True, but I think, the, I think Rust. the argument there is that, like, uh, like, well, you wouldn't want to do it for CPU-bound work that, um, at least, like, an old school Python or Ruby, let's say, like, like writing a highly concurrent... Well, no, 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 sure, Ruby, right? So you're, you're taking one of the slowest languages, right? But that's... Like, if, if you care about performance, you should compare Node to C++ or, like, Rust, then, right? right. Not Ruby. Well, but but I would say that Node's, like, like writing in JavaScript is a lot, or writing in that because you're single-threaded. Um, and while callbacks aren't necessarily easy, uh, it's at least a little more simpler. They don't have to understand true, like, threading context that you might write in, like, a Java or a C++ application. I guess, I'm not saying that's correct, but I feel like that's an argument that's made. That, that you get that middle ground. I mean, that's just an argument to cripple yourself because you don't understand threading, though. Yeah, but isn't Where that obviously an argument? Like the the lowest common denominator when you're writing an enterprise app, you want like I want to be able to hire whoever and have him be able to add features to this app without being uh, a a guru. I mean, is threading the line for guru now? Is that is that what we're saying? I think I mean, we I, live I, in I a node a... world. I think it might be. So, okay, so so you and I fundamentally don't agree where the line is here. Because I to me, it's like, geez, if that's the line, then, then damn, right? Yeah. Like, and maybe it's node, not, maybe it's not. Node, but for some people, that's the impression I get. Well, then that makes Node your only real option. Well, what about Go? I was going to, I was going to, I meant to bring that up earlier. Go right. uh, is like celebrating its 10 year anniversary. All right, um, but Go is much more akin to a C++ solution, right? Like Go, yes, under the hood. But first of all, Go is faster. Yes. Go does not give you as much as Node does. And I would argue that Go is much more, 
first of all, it goes a language, right? Yeah. Node is written in JavaScript, so let's not let's not we're kind of mixing apple and oranges, but it's I would say that Go is you I mean you could pull in frameworks and libraries that make it like Node or like Rails, but on its on its face, the Go language versus the JavaScript language is much more fundamentally like a C++ if written in 27, right? 2007. Uh, sure. Uh, I, mean, I don't yeah, know. Rob, Rob Pike finally got to, to make the thing that he wanted. Right. I mean, I don't think it was the right choice either. I, I, I'm still not convinced. I mean, this is going to get some hate mail. I've looked at Go. I'm not convinced it's any better than OBC or C++. In fact, I think it's fundamentally worse. But... No, it is worse than all of the choices we've mentioned so far in my mind, right? Like, yeah. hell, if you if you have money, just buy some more RAM and write it in Ruby. Like, please. Nope, that's Sorry. fair. No, no, no. I, I'm I don't uh, I do not disagree with that. I do think there is this, and I don't know if it's accurate or not, but I think there is a perception that like, and maybe it's not true for like simple web apps, but like if you're writing. Um, like real time, highly concurrent applications. Like um, one book that's like consistently recommended is Java Concurrency in Practice by uh, Brian Getz. Uh, and I think there's a lot of developers, or at least there's an impression that there's a lot of developers out there who don't, who couldn't write correct shared memory based, uh, highly concurrent software easily. Um, so that's like one weird thing where like Go tries to target, uh, you know, with its like CSP based concurrency model. Where, where it is, you're definitely right, it is a lot more low level in terms of like C++ style, but it has, it has like first class con- concurrency primitives, which maybe we need in 2017. Maybe. I mean, I mean, the argument begs the question, like, does this actually solve the problem that you had? Sure. And saying that you have the problem or saying that we need it because it's 2017 doesn't actually prove that point. I mean, I would argue if you could show me one application or help, you know, show me five, right? Show me five applications that are written in Node that at a reasonable cost could not be written in, in any other language, then I would say that Node is a revolutionary technology. No one can do that, right? I mean, my opinion is that no one can do that. <laughs> right. I mean, I could be wrong, and I would love for people to prove me wrong. I think Node is kind of a masturbatorial thing. Like, I hate to say it, but it's... It's madness, right? JavaScript, I, I actually am coming to like JavaScript, but it would not be my backend language of choice. Right. No, I agree. Yeah, so it's, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Wes, can you think of five applications in Node that couldn't be written otherwise? On it, on the technological merits, no. Um, maybe in terms of, uh, well, you can compare it to Java, uh, but... Uh, you know, it does. It does have all those momentum things. Like there are a thousand libraries for just about anything that you want to do in Node now. Uh, but but that's that's a community argument and not a technical argument. Technically, no. Uh, I don't. You know, it doesn't bring a lot. V8 itself is impressive in terms of compiling uh, JavaScript, which at least was a terrible language that's now grown up a little bit. Uh, but but in terms of getting reasonable performance, I think V8 is an impressive process. But if I'm not wrong, V8 is a C++ program? Yep. <laughs> so uh, and that's, so and there that's we the go. And under, underlying irony of this whole thing, right? Like, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, um, it's C++ of the hood. So I don't buy it. I mean, JavaScript is winning on purely Reaganomic fundamentals of its cheaper and managers want to spend as little money as possible. And I'm a manager myself, and I want to spend as little, as money, as little money as possible. Yeah, right. exactly. So, and you know, my margins are tight, and I get it. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to demonize managers because, you know, people have never been cheaper. People are expecting more for less on their software. So, wanting to squeeze your margins makes sense to me. But don't say like. Like, listen, if three people apply for a job and one is cheaper and you think they can do the same job, don't, like, lie and say it's because of this other thing. Say the other guy's cheaper, right? Yep. I mean, it, it just seems... I don't know, man. I, I I don't buy it. I think the reality of the situation is that it's easier to hire crappy JavaScript developers than it is to hire anything else, even crappy Ruby developers, which there are a freaking pile of. But, 
yeah, that's what I mean. That's I guess I'm a bastard again. Well, that was nothing new. I mean, that's 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 just part Damn. of the course here on the Coda Radio program. Since 1988, baby. Since 1988, it's Michael Dominic, bastard for life. Um. So okay. So one thing. So there's no. Uh. There's go. Uh, which which has has some arguments for it. There's certainly a lot of popularity things written in Go, things like uh, you know Kubernetes, um, tons of container stuff, Docker, um, Rocket, etc. And then, and then there's the weird, wild world of Erlang. Have you ever dabbled there? No, this is your own dark little world here. Yeah. So so one thing it has in common is, uh, with Smalltalk, which has been a recent a recent Best hobby of you yep. is a focus on message passing uh, as you know, as a as a primitive for the language. Uh, so you so you might like that already. Um, Erlang came out of a history. Uh, it, it's created by Ericsson, and it was and it was built for a time when they needed, you know, they they make telephone switches. So they're like these massively available concurrent parallel systems that need to need to have low latency and hard real-time guarantees or at least not hard real-time but soft real-time guarantees uh and they they created this elixir or not elixir sorry, excuse me erlang language uh it evolved out of prologue and so it has this weird kind of prologue uh, syntax it's it's pretty strange um so I know a lot of people who who have been who've shied away from it for exactly that reason because it's it's hard to work with. It has weird primitives. It has its own weird VM. There's a new kid on the block though, and that's Elixir. Um, and I don't know if you've like heard that much about it, but it seems to be gaining a lot of momentum. It has a very popular, at least in its weird world, uh, web framework called Phoenix, um, and it's it's kind of being touted as, you know, the next big thing for writing easily, like highly concurrent software. So instead of using Go or Node, Elixir. For things like, you know, maybe you need a WebSocket server, things like that. Okay, so Elixir contains its own web server and socket system. Yeah, so so the real the real magic is this uh, Beam VM. Um, and the idea is it's it, you know so it's its own virtual machine much like the JVM but it's it's built to it's built with this idea of running distributed systems it has the notion of a distributed system built within it already um, and so it has all these primitives for launching processes and it it has an um, M and scheduler written already and it has what you might in Go our Go routines. Uh, or in some things are fibers, but it has what they call processes, which are their own little, or green threads or another thing that are frequently called, but like really cheap independent execution limits. And then they have their own, you know, they then they have their own process scheduler logic, which will then schedule them, but they're preemptible. And so you get in this, you get in a nice, a nice place where you can, because they're so cheap, you can basically spin up, they use a process for everything. So, for every connection, you can just spin up spin up a process, and none of them can lock the whole system. None of them can fail the whole system. You get immutable data types by default, uh, and you get message passing. So that instead of having shared memory concurrency, you send messages. And so, sure, there is some like data duplication that has to go on there, but uh, there are you know there are underlying efficiencies that will will mask that behind the scenes copy and write shared memory structures etc uh, but you get like a fairly clean sort of system um, i know one thing that's replicated it is akka the scala library they're they're big on this actor model um and so it presents this it presents sort of a they 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 also have supervision trees so there's a very popular library that everyone pretty much uses called otp um which is called which is the open telephony uh is it a project or protocol or I don't know what the P is, but uh, it's a set of it's a set of primitives for dealing with these distributed systems. So you get like, have you ever used Supervisor D? It's like a process management thing lets you spawn like services. Mm-hmm. It sounds familiar, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, so so basically, you have these things. So instead of writing a bunch of error handling code let's say you basically spawn trees of processes so that you say like hey go try to make a make a http connection over here and where you might have like exception handling to say like oh well it might fail or not um, 
Instead, you don't clutter up all of your actual programming logic with that code, but it's in the supervision system. So you spin up a process, it goes and tries. If it fails, it dies. Its supervisor knows to retry X number of times. Um, and if that happens, then the supervisor dies, and you just have that just goes back upstream. Uh, so you can handle all of your systems this way, and it's built with the idea of easily being able to run, like, you can install the Erlang VM on six boxes, get them all talking to each other, and then just run processes across all of them. Uh, so it's some of the technology, like uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp uses it to run. Uh, they use FreeBSD and Erlang to run like they have like a tiny little team and they run crazy numbers of connections like millions of connections to one of their big free bsd server boxes um so some people see it as sort of a like a secret sauce for super scalability i don't know if it's quite that or not but it's been something i've been dabbling in a little bit so what what is the practical advantage of all that well i think as in many things it presents a simpler a simpler model. Um, you know, it's immutable by default. Uh, Elixir really takes a lot of the functional things it's learned from from Scala and uh, Clojure and others. So, like, it has data pipeline type transformations, like we were talking about earlier, where you have immutable data structures that flow through functions that just transform them and return the results. Uh, that's all first class. It has meta programming as first class and. Elixir brings a friendlier Ruby style syntax to the Erlang VM. Um, uh, okay, got it. Yeah, so it's not quite Ruby, but it has a Ruby-ish flavor, like the like the the do blocks and other things, and the you know that the ends, all all that kind of all that kind of syntax. All right, so so it just makes it easier to interact with it, basically. Yes, exactly. Um, now, are you using this in production at all? Not currently. Okay, but is it something you plan to use in production? Yeah. Very possibly, and I know some people who are using it in production. It's definitely it's definitely gained a lot of traction um, because it's um, in in sort of a Lisp style. It's it has like a core written in Erlang, and Erlang's been around since the '80s. It's it's very well battle tested, um, and then everything else in it is basically written as macros on top of that. So it's got like a really simple core. It's very extensible. You can customize it as much as you need, and it's really like instead of having to write a whole bunch of logic to run. You know, I think a lot of developers have gotten in that situation where you're like, well, I wrote this thing and it runs on one server. And then you get to the point of like, oh, now I need to make like a distributed system where I have queues or maybe Kafka's involved or Redis or other things. In the Erlang world, all like half of those primitives are all built into the VM. Like you have a transactional distributed database built into it between message passing. Like it's really easy to build simple queues and other things. So it's like a different model to how we build distributed systems currently. Okay, that makes sense. So, what is the what? What would you say is like the one or two killer feature? And then we should probably get off this kind of we're short on time. Yeah, but, that's true. Uh, what would you say is like the one or two killer features of this over, say, a Rails? I mean, obviously performance, but that's you know, let's put performance aside. Yeah, per, uh, performance and simple scalability. Uh, the the ability to okay. to have a lot of those sort of primitives built right in and dealt with by your frameworks and not having to reach out. Like I've, I've maintained some, some pretty crummy rails apps that use things like delayed job or other task runners in the background. But um, <laughs> crummy. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's, let's take it easy there, yeah. buddy. <laughs> uh, and, and that was a pain because they were like, they, it was just like logically different. They were different set They weren't, they weren't easy to reason about as, as a cohesive whole. Um, Elixir gives you that. And, um, the Beam VM is pretty incredible. Uh, it's, ri it's written in C. It's existed since the 80s. Um, and it ha has some really, really powerful scheduling algorithms as well as a per process garbage collector. Um, so rather than okay. like a whole stop the world, it's per individual process. Processes are super cheap, super quick to spin up. So you kind of get to like, if you've ever wanted to be able to like, you've had a problem, you're like, man, I wish I could just spin up a process for each of these. But you're like, but that won't scale. In the Erlang world, that scales. It's easy. And the whole system is designed to do it. So, like, if you want to, like, have a whole bunch of clients all connect to your system, you just spin up a process for each of them, and then you have a way to reason about all of them, to collect the results, to have them share state, et cetera, whatever you need.
So like web sockets, um, interactive backend servers, we have tons of connections. And but then okay. but then a huge part of it too is like you could do that in like Node is a thing that's written for that as, as, as well. But because it's all written as message passing and between processes, it's still like it looks synchronous. So you don't have to write in this callback hell style or fill it with easy, a bunch of promises. Easier to write. Well, message passing is just much easier to reason about, right? Exactly. Than callback hell, right? That's that's the yeah. yeah. So I would say those are like the, those are the two things that combine to make it to make it an interesting See, model. That makes a lot more sense to me. Everything you just kind of data dumped on me makes a lot more sense kind of architecturally to me than Node. Yeah, I agree. I right? think, but, but I, I think the fundamental problem is that Node, the developer writes in JavaScript, which everybody claims to know. Exactly. And this, they don't, right? I did not mean to this to be so sad or negative. Um, no, I think that's the perfect way to, to draw this to a conclusion. It's, it's, that's like kind of the theme here, right? Is that there are a lot of more technically interesting, maybe technically correct solutions, but that is not the world that we live in, perhaps largely because of economics or Reaganomics, as you should say. I call it Reaganomics. And I like I'm a that. Republican, so. so you get to. Yes, it's my word. All right. Well, as homework, you should go uh, just go read about Elixir a little bit. See if it's interesting. Oh, I'm going to. I'm going to write a Jar Jar bot in Elixir if I can. Oh, that sounds amazing. I would love to see that. And then next time I'm here, we can talk about it. Morally bankrupt programming. Ooh, excellent. All right. Well, that's probably enough for this uh, this uh, crazy ram shamble of an episode. Anything else you would like to leave our dear audience with? Just go to Buccaneer.io and at Tumnook on Twitter. And by the way, I am looking for the one true ipad project so if you have an ipad idea and you want it done i'm willing to make deals because i need it what i would call a marquee portfolio piece on ipad right now well you heard it here first folks one true ipad project get in touch with mr michael dominic this has been episode 277 believe it or not of the coder radio program if you want more head on over to jupiterbroadcasting.com there is the archives of all the episodes of this awesome show and a whole bunch of other fine shows you can find more of me at at west Payne or uh, check out the the TechSnap podcast Mr. Dominic, where can they find you? Um, at Buccaneer.io and at Dumanuko on Twitter. Go check out Mr. Michael Dominic and stay tuned for more Coder Radio. <laughs> <laughs>